Okay, so let's move on to the second uh, session of this session. So the intent of this session is to have um, people who have experience in developing and implementing policy uh, in the region to share with others their experiences, uh, hopefully to enable a, a dialogue, a dialogue, dialogue, dialogue um, uh, that will support those who may not be as familiar with that, uh, uh, that, that science into policy uh, interface. So first up this afternoon, uh, I'm very happy to, um, to share with you that we have David Robin here. David works at the uh, OECS. Uh, I'm sure he I'll allow him to present himself and he may be very familiar to many of you on the call. So David, uh, are you there? There we go, I can see. I, I sincerely hope that my answer to your question is in the affirmative that I am here. Wonderful. I can see you and I can hear you. So, David, would you be so kind to share um, the experiences that you have had within the context of the OECS and taking that last example of mine with the development of the e-crop and the crop and the outcomes of that effort since 2013 and, and, and maybe give us something of a foresight of where you see it going? Uh, the, the way I, I anticipate the next couple of hours going, if, it, if we need a couple of hours, is that uh, people can put their hands up, ask questions as we go along. Um, and then, like you see, we have representatives from Belize and Jamaica that also would like to share their experiences. So, David, over to you in the first instance. Well, I thank you very much um, for, Alan, for inviting us to um, participate in this um, this uh, meeting workshop and uh, I take this opportunity to um, say on behalf of the Director General of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, our Director of uh, Environmental Sustainability Development, Dr. Dedicus Jules and Mr. Chamberlain Emmanuel respectively and of course all of our colleagues at the OECS Commission and um, to greet all of the persons who are participating. I wish to thank you for your presentation and uh, I would not um, try to uh, underpin any of it because I think it certainly aligns to what we see, are seeking to do in the OECS. I would just uh, very quickly say that the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States uh, was established in 1981 and uh, it is really an inter intergovernmental organization in the Eastern Caribbean comprising um, 11 uh, full and associate member states and fundamentally its, um, its purpose, its raison d'etre is to foster integration in the Eastern Caribbean. With that said, on matters of ocean, the OECS in as early as 1982, started conversations in a very integrated manner on matters pertaining to ocean. The first integrated action uh, in anticipation of a new law for the Eastern Caribbean. That is how we claimed UNCLOS. Um, was looking therefore at how we would move forward in a very integrated way. And that was with work done with, um, with um, Canada and moving forward and related publications therefrom. So we have been doing things of um, marine protected areas of that kind of work. We had uh, integrated um, uh, fisheries policy because that was the, one of the first areas that we looked at, harmonized fisheries legislation, such that national knowledge translated into regional competence. So we always had that integrated approach. 
you have quite correctly mentioned what then happened with support from the Commonwealth Secretariat. And um, that resulted in the Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy. And yes, you were correct, it was 2013, the initial one. So I did not have to contribute to that. And that moved the process forward. But even before then, how did this come about? The, there was work done all the way from in the 1990s and moving forward that even continued to build on the approaches so that we had the St. George's Declaration of Principles for Environmental Sustainability in the Eastern Caribbean, which is um, now a revised St. George's Declaration of Principles for Sustainability. And that now is looking at 2020 to 2040. But it is based on a foundational principle which is called the Island Systems Management Principle. That takes an integrated look at not only our land space, but also our sea space. And so it, is moved, it has moved forward in that way. So let's speak about some alignments and some frameworks. Since we had the OECS established, this was by a treaty in 1981. And later on in 2010, we had the um, revised Treaty of Basque establishing the OECS Economic Union. The point I wish to simply make by this is that the protocol to that treaty established the Eastern Caribbean Economic Union. The treaty entered into force in 2011. And so while we are working as the, OE, the, the, the CARICOM region, what we have is then the OECS, would be could be considered to as the center, if you will, of the concentric circles from the perspective of the English speaking Caribbean. Um, because we have now moved to the place of an economic union and wider immediately out of this is the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, which establishes the Caribbean single market and economy. So as we have moved forward in this way, so our frameworks based on that have become even more integrated and indivisible. I use this terminology because it then aligns with what we have had with the 2030 development agenda, inclusive of the sustainable development goals. So in 2019, through the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project. And you have outlined correctly how that has influenced through to the World Bank, and then now moving um, to having the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project, which then became effective um, in 2017, and which goes until the end of this year. We have been developing foundational and integrated principles for a sustainable ocean economy, a blue economy in the OECS. And with that, 
what we have had is deliver, delivered a revised Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy and a strategic action plan with not just policies, but sustainable, but achievable outcomes. It is aligned to the 2030 development agenda, all of it, because in dealing with the requirements on land and on sea, and mindful of the foundational principle that I told you of the island um, systems management, then what um, we have had is that that principle was enshrined in the ECRO as a guiding principle. Of course, sustainable development is a guiding, is a even, a, even more overarching principle because it then connects to all of the SDGs. Given that we can make the argument that relative to our land size, we are large ocean states, large ocean states. Collectively, the OECS has an ocean space about the size of Germany. So um, I hope that helps with the perspective. Of course, subject to the delimitation of maritime boundaries in accordance with international law, where they have not yet um, been concluded. And let us then look at some of the outcomes just very quickly based on what you have outlined. Um, yes, we still have as not necessarily in order of importance, but it still has to be maintained that through our outcome relating to the um, access to marine resources achieved, then the goal here is that our maritime boundaries would be delivered, concluded. And so that is fun of fundamental importance because the question is, where does your jurisdiction begin and end? Where do you have authority to govern and to make sure that what happens within that space is managed. So that is of fundamental import. Then there are other related de um, deliverables. So all of these are aligned and integrated. The vision in the revised Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy and do this along with the strategic action plan as aligned with what are in national ocean policies and strategic action plans, which have been developed and delivered for the countries participating in the Caribbean Regional Oceanscape Project. And those are done in such a way so that even for those countries that have not participated through our coordinating mechanism, which preceded the development and let me just or not only preceded, but I should say preceded and as well um, contributed to the um, initial Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy and technically approved the revised Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy, we have a, a regional coordination mechanism called our Ocean Governance Team. The Ocean Governance Team is comprised representatives from the National Ocean Governance Committees, which are the national coordination mechanisms that advise and oversee and really 
ought to have the role of monitoring implementation of the national ocean policies and strategic action plans. So together, they are the interlocutors between the national ocean policies and strategic action plans and the revised Eastern Caribbean regional ocean policies and strategic action plans and they are contributing to this holistic, uh, visionary, and integrated approach. Now that is aligned to a blue-green blue, green and circular economy approach, all of which are also um, integrated in the way we look at how we need to move forward. So with this, then, all of our commitments from regional and international instruments are recognized as to what then would form our policies moving forward. Not every member state is at the same locate, same place in terms of policies or what they what or what they require as priorities, because some may have certain aspects more advanced than others. And so the national ocean policies and strategic action plan are such that, that they take into consideration those differences and those flexibilities. We also have then um, coastal integrated coastal and marine spatial plans. And we are at the place of finalizing, um, well, those are really now prepared and are at their final stages. And this is the first time, any time, anywhere in the world that integrated coastal and marine spatial plans have been done. So those are the realities um, for us. And why is it so important? When you are small island developing states, who are among the most vulnerable in the world, you are essentially the canary in the mine. When things are going wrong, and especially when you know the challenges for the future we want, I pick that phraseology deliberately. So, taking into consideration that we have an integrated and indivisible ocean space. We have geographical boundaries, but the ecosystem is not so divided, nor are the resources. And it brings me to the point that you have been um, making of the BBNJ and how that may relate to the use of science. How have we sought to approach then that move for us going forward? We are now moving to as well have a marine spatial planning framework for the Eastern Caribbean region. And so, taking that into consideration, it will look at how the cross boundaries, the interjurisdictional considerations can take place. And so that neighboring states can move forward with these. It is also important to point out that even in um, boundary delimitation approaches, um, two of our last boundaries, which were delimited, 
in 2017 expressly referred to the Sustainable Development Goals. So, protection of 30 by 30. If your land space is so small and your sea space, while it is relatively large, only has a narrow coastal belt where there is more intense um, activity, which 30% do you protect? So are we talking protection? Because we need to do 80% of the global uh, or of national jurisdiction. If we do not have the integration, as you have pointed out with BDNJ. So does it mean strict protection or does it mean marine managed areas? And then the issue of science informing policy. When are we going to get us as scientists? I'm not a scientist, but I'm aligning with you here. Sufficiently rabid so that we can bite our politicians and we can cause them to be infected with our disease of understanding the need for change. You have made the point, and this bite is not literal, but in terms of our advocacy with effectiveness, because you have made the point that it is only the electorate that can influence. How can we cause our electorate to be so influential that we then have the reverse, that the policy is such that it speaks to the future we want. Because globally, we are at a stage where with all of what has been happening on our oceans, we will soon um, get to a point of no return if we do not make some drastic changes. Um, example, for current projections are that by 2050, without the requisite changes, we'll have more plastic in the oceans than fish. The reality is while we have had a lot of all of the promises, concerning matters, for example, of plastic. When it is examined, there is less than 10% of plastics made that it is possible to recycle. That is a fundamental reality. If we check the facts of it, the promises that have been made by industry have never been achievable. And so then we have um, oceans of microplastics afloat and these two will have to be addressed. It brings me to a very critical question related to what you have asked about BBNJ, is it timely? And then it brings my mind to fisheries subsidies negotiations at the WTO. How are they integrated? Should fisheries subsidies negotiations be a pure trade matter now or led only from a perspective of trade or should it be the future we want? Um, Alan, I think I am just obliged to say that all of our frameworks are integrated. And we consider that it's more important to get the policy 
to be visionary, to get the policy to be holistic, to get the policies to be integrated, and then construct the laws, revise the laws as necessary to give, to, in, to ensure that those policies are enshrined in law. Um, that is essentially the manner in which the OECS sees that this has to be done. So that across all areas, we are seeking now and with the member states on board to ensure that the triple bottom line is achieved. Okay. Environmental, economic, and social sustainability. I thank you and I need to make apologies because it will be necessary for me to get dash in very soon. I shall wait for any questions which we may have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, that's a wonderful insight into the, uh, the nature of the work of the OECS there. And I think the value of recognizing th those higher level um, uh, organizational aspirational UN type frameworks that need to be taken into account for and how a regional organization such as the OCS does that and tries to bring that into more of a cohesive uh, approach on the regional scale so thank you for that. Um, does anybody have any questions for David please? You can either shout or put it in the chat function there. I don't see any hands. I have a quick question, David, and I'm conscious that you need to shoot off. Um, you, you started by saying that one of the first things you did was to align uh, the fisheries policies in the region. Now, what was the motivation for starting with fisheries um, back then? Back then, a lot of our folks um, we're working in fisheries significantly. We still have a number of persons who are employed in fisheries. Um, we were certainly aspiring to be able to do um, matters of um, greater harvesting, sale, um, sustainable utilization, and so forth. And uh, that was one of the areas that um, we started working on. Uh, there was an OECS fisheries unit, which was established, um, well, it started as a fisheries desk and it, then it moved to a fisheries unit. And um, at that time, while it was called a fisheries unit, it started looking at all of the integrated areas and a more holistic approach to um, the law of the sea requirements. Okay. But we thought we should move with what for us was basically the low hanging fruit. I was, I was going to say as a popular subject, it's probably an appropriate place to start. But I think as trends have evolved in the last 30 years since the OCS was established, um, you, can, you can see why other things come to the fore. So thank you for that. Um, anybody else have any questions? Uh, I see. Judith. I see. Can you discuss the issue of enforcement of regulations for sales? Is that a question that we should attempt? Is that uh, the intention? I think it is. Judith, do you want to? Yes, um, I'm, I may not be phrasing it correctly. But I'm just assuming that um, given that there, you know, there is a policy and there's a determination to have uh, limitations of certain kinds, how challenging is it for small island developing states to police their waters, for example? That is uh, the wonderful reality. Thank you for that question. So there is an organization called the Regional Security System. 
The regional security system was established by a memorandum of understanding in 2000, in um, 1982, about one year, just less than one year after the OECS, which was by a treaty. The regional security system is comprised uh, the six independent OECS member states and Barbados. But there is a deep integration between what happens, as I said, uh, with the concentric circle and what happens at the um, CARICOM region. So security is the fourth pillar of CARICOM. And there is an overarching um, integrating mechanism that looks at um, security at the CARICOM level. And they are aligned so that um, responses now, as including the extraordinary impacts of the COVID pandemic, are also being done through the RSS. And the RSS is delivering not just within um, the member states, but with all, within the CARICOM member states as needed. And uh, there are responses there. So there is a CARICOM treaty that um, deals with security. And we look at that. So how do we deal with the police? In the revised ECROP, our second um, achievable outcome deals with this whole thing of being able to have safety, security, monitoring, control, and surveillance. We will recognize that there are limitations in this regard because relative to the ocean sizes and the cost of, um, and the means to do this work, it is challenging. At this point, there is a goal 17 in the sustainable development goal. And I show, I'm absolutely sure you are fully aware of it. It is called partnership. There are some things we know, we absolutely know that have to be done, but the means to do them are not all there. So what are the new ways in which we can monitor what's happening, and then be able to move our enforcement to the place of risk management, rather than trying to search our entire space. These are some of the practical approaches. How can we then do these and do a new form of, coastal, of a coastal watch system, for example, uh, drawing on some of the um, tools that are already there but making them even more efficient and effective. So um, those are some of the approaches. Uh, these really need conversations. And let me take the opportunity to say that um, when we are looking at the coastal and marine spatial plans, we are not just looking now at the ocean um, from the point of view of um, the area, but a three-dimensional approach. There are things that we can be able to do on the bottom. There are things we can be able to do in the middle and there are things that we can do on the surface. And um, as the scientists will know, those are three separate areas of the ocean. So that is our approach to management in an integrated way. So the tools and the, 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 the means to um, search and collect scientific information uh, and then what do we do with all of this data question, Alan, that you had raised? Uh, yes, we are looking at how we also move to a place um, where we have a marine and integrated means to deal with our marine data management. And it has to cater for all of the areas. So um, that would include um, what we have for security and then um, the various um, permissions that have to be wherever and so forth. So I'll pause there, thanks. Okay. Thank you, David. Is that okay, Judith? Thank you, brilliant.
Thank you. Um, uh, David, again, I'm conscious of the time, but I see Claire Evans has her hand up. Claire? Hi, David. Thank you, Alan, for that. Um, that was a really interesting insight into um, your approach and challenges of the OECS. Um, I thought it was very interesting as well that you mentioned, you know, as Sid, you regard yourselves as the canary in the coal mine. I think, I think you're right, that's really important. And you spoke about some of the issues that are really on the agenda now, such as plastics and fisheries. But I wondered if you had a feeling for what would be those upcoming issues that perhaps the wider world hasn't quite keyed into, um, but that you sort of on the front line, as it were, um, as SIDS might be experiencing with regard to your marine environments and um, ensuring sustainability. Thank you. Um, while I do not remember the specific quotation, I thank you for this question because the UN Secretary General, I think with us at the Blue Cop, essentially said to us, we are destroying the very planet which is supporting us. Fundamentally, the problem is over-exploitation. Okay? And this cannot be changed in any way other than us recognizing this and then we own it. Um, while I said we are the canary in the mine, we have the duty and responsibility then to be the moral conscience and to make the point as I tried to make them. But the means to do the change is essentially one, the issue of climate change. The over-exploitation, let me give a specific example. It is possible to exploit land so much in the search for minerals that, um, that um, apologies, Alan. That's okay. Please. Yes, um, such, that, um, such that it is not possible to use the soil anymore. The imp it impacts human lives. All of that from there into the ocean. The biggest single matter uh, then that's impacting us are those of um, climate, the effects of climate change. Look at, um, let's take 2017. All right, where we had uh, all of those tremendous, terrible impacts. Okay. Yeah. Um, so with that, I think more than anything else, we have all of the what we are losing with the warming at um, in at the Arctic and Antarctic. It's it's there. It's happening. Okay. And we are feeling a tremendous amount of those impacts. So um, what we are seeking to do is use science and best practices to inform a lot of our work, uh, where it's possible to use natural solutions uh, to, to those. Um, and then, but that came back to the question of how can we cause persons to become sufficiently rabid? So that we actually have a flip where the policy is then saying we have to do things differently. So I think I'll pause there and okay. on, on that question, please. That's brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat or any other hands up. Um, so on that, I'd like to thank you very much, David, for giving up your time today and for sharing those experiences uh, and if you can hang around that would be wonderful I'm sure you would have uh, I, I regret I, I would not be able to do that, so Alan that, I am okay. that that that's my alert that I am about to um, miss um, a, 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 a critical deadline there you go well I wouldn't want you so to I need to get on the way now um, and I, I trust that my apologies could be accepted Absolutely, you, you, you've contributed 
more than enough. So thank you very much, David. Uh, and uh, You're most welcome. Back, and we'll keep, Thanks much. Keep in touch. So yes. thank you. Um, so next up, we have uh, Andrea. So Andrea um, from Belize, uh, I believe you have some slides you'd like to share. Is that correct? Yes, I will be sharing my screen in a few. Oh, unfortunately, like Samir couldn't join me. Um, okay. And I say unfortunately because he was an integral part of the um, integrated coastal zone management plan, which I'll show in a few. Okay, so I, I've stopped sharing now. So please, I believe you are able to. So there we go. That's great. Yeah. So... Um, like I said, I'll just be sharing some few, uh, so key pointers and lessons learned on the Belize Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. Um, so we published um, and passed uh, Belize Coastal Zone Management Plan um, to cabinet in 2016. Um, with this plan, we also have for Belize some area specific um, guidance for nine coastal planning regions, which within these plans, we have specific issue identification that are region specific, um, have relevant legislation, policy, and uh, lead agencies for each and every region. At the end of my presentation, I will be sharing a link um, as to where these guidelines and the plan can be downloaded. Um, for the entire development process of the plan, several approaches were taken, such as literature review and research, stakeholder engagement, ecosystem service modeling, and lastly, marine spatial planning. Um, although these are just four um, approaches that I have here, the end result to get to the, the passing of the plan to cabinet is, was a very, very lengthy process. Um, and I'll just be sharing some reflections on the importance of science for policy and some application in Belize's ICZM process and anticipated science um, needs in the near term. So firstly, uh, you cannot manage, develop appropriate policies for what you do not know. Um, best available data or information is critical to inform the decision-making process in an accurate and impactful manner. If we do not know the temporal or spatial range of human use activities and coastal and marine resources being managed and their current state, we run the risk of having out of touch or ineffective and irrelevant policies and legislation and regulations. And the paucity of robust data, the scarcity of robust data will prevent um, us from comprehending the needs for integrated coastal zone management policies that are coherent and holistic. By this, I mean um, oceanographic, biodiversity, human use data, socio-cultural, economic valuation and um, anthropogenic impacts. Um, science allows us to undertake rapid assessments of the state of the coastal zone and it is necessary to have baselines and assess management gaps and trigger the formulation of new or revised policies. Um, for Belize, data and science has underpinned, has truly underpinned the approach to ICZM. Um, if you look through the plan, you can clearly see what I mean, but available data has provided a solid evidence base for effective policy formation. It has specifically allowed us to understand dynamic coastal processes, how we interact with the coastal and marine environment, and really how we can use it to better protect and conserve it. Um, using the science and the data, we have been able to assess the role of key marine ecosystems in terms of benefits we receive from them, the impacts of human use activities, and assess trade-offs if the right policies do not exist. Um, 
The science policy approach has allowed Belize to assess the implications of future management and policy scenarios. Um, I have conservation development and informed management. And by this, I mean, when we were developing the plan, we looked, we, we incorporated models um, and different schemes, different zoning schemes to look at different um, scenarios for Belize. And we went with the informed management scheme. And this scheme blends strong conservation goals with current and future needs that minimizes the risk to coastal um, habitats and potential loss that minimizes risk to these habitats and um, uh, really presents the importance for economic ecosystem services. And if you closely examine um, the spatial or human use activities, the ICZM plan spells out, it really spells out the policy in terms of a schedule or permitted uses or restricted uses in an effort to encourage um, compatibility and reduce user conflict that can have damaging effects on the resources. And now looking into the future, um, this is important because although we have a very robust and comprehensive plan, um, now looking into the future when we want to update that plan, we have to look at the gaps and the challenges that were that we faced back in 2016. And so Belize really needs to maintain a long continuous record of coastal monitoring data and robust oceanographic information at improved resolution, scale and national coverage. Um, it will help our ocean literacy current to understand shifting baselines and have a current understanding of the state of coastal zone for an accurate marine spatial planning and policy interventions. Um, because now in Belize we're under a new ministry called the Ministry of the Blue Economy and Civil Aviation, the data science will be needed to inform this new ministry model for sustainable development. Um, we need to look at or question what new opportunities exist. Are they feasible? Are they sustainable? And um, at CZMI particularly, we need to strengthen the technical capacity in terms of forecasting, predictive modeling, uh, reporting, visualization, and the production of policy products in order to better bridge the gap between science and policy. So for example, you know, we collect a lot of data, um, but how do we transform this into policy? And lastly, um, for Belize, Belize as a whole, we need to strengthen the model to determine specific parameters or data needs. We need to um, question what are the drivers of coastal, coastal change? What are the pathways or mechanisms impacting uh, coastal change such as erosion or flooding events, uh, what are the resources in the coastal zone, the, what are the changes in habitat loss and beach volume. So there's a lot of um, data that needs to be collected and questions that need to be answered. And this is the end of my presentation. This is the link where the Belize ICZM plan and all of the region specific guidelines for Belize uh, can be downloaded. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. It looks like a very impressive setup that you have over there in Belize. Um, does anybody have any questions for Andrea? I see no hands or anything in the chat box. I have a question for you, Andrew, if you don't mind. Uh, actually, a couple of questions. Um, you alluded at the very beginning that the, the cabinet uh, pro or the process for cabinet sign-off was fairly lengthy. Can, can you just share what 
what the issues were in that. Um, that's the first question. And the second question relating to monitoring uh, of data, ongoing monitoring. How have you found accessing funding to, to deliver that long-term monitoring? And, and is it fair to say that it's because there is a policy in place that enables you to access that funding? I'll start with the first one. Um, so I'm, I had mentioned that it was passed by cabinet um, in 2016, but the, this process, the, the approaches in getting the plan finalized was very lengthy because the plan had incorporated um, many, many drafts of the Belize ICZM plan. And a lot, it took a lot of researchers, um, NGOs and government agencies and stakeholders on a whole to really chip in, so to speak. So there was, um, the, the draft or the final draft in 2010, but after CZMAI partnered with the Natural Capital Project and researchers at Stanford and the Nature Conservancy and other stakeholders, uh, we incorporated the um, science models. Uh, we use a tool called INVEST, but the, the biggest challenge was getting all of the necessary data to incorporate in the models. Um, in Belize, um, some people would say, you know, we have no data or limited data, but I believe we do have the data, but it is in, in specifically not in a GIS format or not in a readily available format to easily incorporate into the models. They are on um, paper, or in Excel, Excel spreadsheets. So they're, they're not in the um, format that we wanted it to. And just acquiring that amount of data needed um, and the entire revision um, uh, with stakeholders takes a long process. Okay. Uh, um, what was the next question? It, it was relating to accessing funding for this long-term monitoring. Yes, um, the NATCAP project um, and the WWF really had helped us back in 2016 um, for the formulation of the plan, acquiring necessary data sets um, doing aerial surveys, uh, biomonitoring. But now going through the revision of the plan, um, we just wrapped up a project called NCAP which has really helped us to uh, collect a lot of baseline development data for the country. Um, we also have a water quality unit, which they have helped um, to, to acquire um, some national water quality um, data sets. But really, um, since you brought up the issue of funding, that is really an area where a type of plan at this scale, a national plan really requires a lot of funding and at times it is challenging to access um, that to the, to the specific amount that we need because this, like I mentioned, it's a very lengthy approach and it requires um, a lot of funding. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, there's a uh, see a question here from Judith. Could you share the full link to the oh yeah? So is it possible that you could just copy copy oh. it maybe into the chat? Oh there you go. Okay. And Thank you. done it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So are there any other questions for Andrea? No? Okay. Thank you very much. So if you if you could shut stop sharing your screen, there we go. Sure. Wonderful. So finally, uh, last but, and certainly by no means least, um, we have Sean Townsend. Uh, Sean is from Jamaica um, and I don't believe Sean has any slides, but please, Sean, uh, take it away. All right, good afternoon and good morning, colleagues. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I must admit that after the presentations this morning, I do feel like the lone canary in the cold tunnel. 
Uh, reason being is because um, my what I my intention of, of, of today's discussion is to stimulate some discussion. It's like it's more food for thought um, as opposed to representing um, the Jamaican context as it relates to policies. Um, I was I had made a comment on Monday about um, getting practitioners more involved in the process and in so doing someone encouraged me to be a part of this discussion uh, this, this morning. <laughs> so um, first of all, I should introduce myself. I am Sean Thompson. I am from Jamaica, as you said before. I have a degree in, a PhD in marine science, specifically in oceanography. I like to call it biophysical oceanography because of the context of what I do. Um, currently, I work at the Urban Development Corporation, which is Jamaica's agency for development. So we establish urban centers and, and spearhead a lot of the large-scale development projects for the, um, for the island. And my responsibility is to um, ensure that the projects that we undertake have little or no environmental impact, make sure that they're sustainable and so forth. In another realm, I'm also the president of the Jamaica Institute of Environmental Professionals and our mission is to promote um, sound science-based environmental management practices. And so we have a network of persons both in government and private sector working in various aspects of environmental management. So I have divided my thoughts or, or um, just to have a little contribution to the policy aspect as Jamaica's context is that we don't have a policy per se that pertains to ocean and coastal zone management, meaning that it's not finalized. It's something that is in draft and it's something that we're working on currently, especially to achieve the goals of the SG, of the SG. Um, we have our overarching development policy called Vision 2030, and that is our roadmap to becoming a developed nation as, as of 2030. And it takes into consideration um, a, um, development right across the nation in different sectors, including the marine and fishery sector, um, and monitoring and evaluation of this as it goes along. So I know that a, there is an interest right now, especially in developing our blue economy, especially because our EE zone is so large. It's, I think it's four or five times the size of the land mass of our country. And we are one of the larger countries within the Caribbean. Um, so I won't try to elaborate on that much because I've not been involved in the development of that policy. I just know it's draft because I did a quick search before speaking to you <laughs> and to see that one actually exists. But when, it come, when I looked on the official list of our established policy, it was not there. So I think I've divided my school of thought into two, two categories. One would be how can researchers assist practitioners and the other is vice versa, how can practitioners assist um, researchers. So I think one of the way that we want that we should consider is the networking. And I must say that um, because of where I sit, they, um, the opportunities to participate in forums like this have been very far and in between. So that's one of the positive things that the pandemic has brought, up, brought about because where conferences like these, workshop activities like these are now um, virtual, it gives persons like me the opportunity to participate and um, catch up with what is going on within the region and internationally. So for that, I really am um, very grateful. So um, in putting my thoughts together, I came up with some ideas. Uh, one of them being networking. So developing a strategy that can um, collaborate between researchers, practitioners. Um, we like to call ourselves technocrats because we, we kind of work at that quasi section of the policy development, the conservation, and the practical application of all of these things. And, we have sometimes some of us sitting at a unique um, space where we can influence the political. So take the scientific information and translate it to um, influencing the political decisions and the decision making, but especially as it, it, it relates to, to national and regional decision making. So it's I think it's 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 an opportunity that should be utilized to. Um, increase the knowledge base of these persons, get them more involved because they can be very influential in how things manifest themselves. Because one of the one of the 
big questions that has been asked is how can um, researchers become more practical? And Alan, you alluded to it earlier about talking about research being solution oriented. So that is an opportunity that can be utilized. So sharing information in terms of sources of data, tools that can be used quickly and easily um, to assist in the decision making process, because in many instances, we're tasked with creating proposals and, 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 and developing um, strat um, strategies, policies, projects, ideas um, to, achieve, to achieve many other goals for national development. And in many instances, a lot of this information is buried in very robust reports and due to time constraints, it may not be um, practical for us to go through the entire report. So sometimes where there is something that is a little more digestible, um, something that is broken down into smaller formats and smitted, um, a lack of a better expression, an executive summary, so to speak, um, where the data is um, summarized in a way that it can be used to craft these um, these projects and um, proposals. Um, also, being able to, because a lot of the, I must admit that I found a lot of the information that being shared over this week very useful, but if I was not here, I would not know that they exist. So it's, it's having to, to, to develop that strategy to, to, to have that information spread um, a lot more. Um, now, as it relates to how can practitioners help researchers, again, networking, again, sharing of lessons learned. Because what has happened is that there are a lot of projects that are taking place, and they're taking place in maybe some are large scale, some are small scale, but all of them have one thing in common. They have data. And that data should, we should be able to col um, collate that data to make it more useful. So in, um, I, I heard some questions asked earlier about, you know, what format is data being collected in, what, um, what is, makes it useful and so forth. It would be good if we would have that information beforehand while crafting these projects so that we could structure it in a way that the data that we are collecting can fit into a larger, into a larger puzzle. Um, and we probably need to figure out, because what has happened is that we have a lot of national databases. I think my colleague from Belize just spoke about it earlier, about how information is printed all over the place and it is in different um, formats. And I think this information is very useful because it is years and years of data that can be used to give some historical perspective. perspective. Um, what may be the challenge is that they, the quality of that data may be a little iffy because of how it's collected, maybe the way in which it was, the intention for which it was, um, for which it was used for. So it would, be, it would be interesting to find a way to make this data useful and can part, um, contribute to the larger um, context of what we're trying to achieve. Um, for me, myself, being somebody who is working in development, my concentration or interest is normally within the near shore region. So, cause we do a lot of development in the coastal areas. And what we find is that this year in particular, we had an interest in doing some um, coastal protection projects. And we have a large scale one that's going on right now. And my team and I were trying to, um, to, to, to gather information about how to find innovative and what we call hybrid solutions. So we work in, I work in a, a, with engineers, architects and stuff. So usually our solutions are very brown, as we like to call it. And sitting in our position, we like more of a green solution. So it was to find that intersection and find that solution that would be useful and, um, and practical and cost effective. What we found is that where these solutions may exist, there's not high confidence in it because I guess they're not been around for a long time or there's not been enough effort being put into monitoring them or even developing them. So more information and more research into hybrid solution, having finding that intersection between the engineers and the ecologists, the, and the, the marine protected area specialists, the, the fisheries experts and so forth to find those solutions that can contribute to coastal protection. Um, uh, 
another thing would be to compile it would be a um a list of a co compile a list of data that's availability the tools and where they can be found um, that would be very helpful to us and in doing so also in networking with the with the um the practitioners is to find out what they need are and so you can then structure the research for those these solution oriented outcomes um, I think I will stop there. I hope I've given you some food for thought and can stimulate some further discussion. That, that's wonderful. Thank you, Sean. There's a, a, a lot to consider there, uh, clearly <laughs> a, a lot going on, and I, I applaud you for starting this Jamaican environmental initiative that you're the president of. So, uh, I mean, that, yes. that sounds <laughs> like, uh, you know, the the makings of a, a forum like the forum I was alluding to where you get all the different yes. stakeholders in to, to actually address the very questions that you're asking and uh, I guess you're asking those questions within that forum as well? Yes. Okay, excellent. Well, I have a few questions but I'd like to encourage others in the, in the audience here to, to come up with some questions for Sean. Is anybody brave enough? No? Okay, well, in that case, I will ask a question because uh, I think you covered a lot of interesting points there, Sean, and, uh, and I think it, it was, it's almost reflective of that, that fragmentation piece that I alluded to, that you alluded to, you know, the, the planning being a very brown thing without it being a bit more green and how you want the engineers and the ecologists to work together. And it's having that holistic overview rather than having those sectoral policies or initiatives working in isolation. So I think that's a good example or demonstration of where there is a need to make sure that that conversation is had. Um, and, and I think you, you, you appear to have the frameworks in place to maybe start enabling that through, through the uh, environmental initiative there. I, I guess in absence of having that is that a, a kind of a volu volunteer type organization or or is it kind of driven by agencies who have a, a an interest in making sure that different agencies speak together i mean um the organization that i speak of is 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 voluntary so yeah. it's um, professionals coming together and trying to participate in the national development however um, Jamaica does have a strategy of having um, interagency committees established to kind of help with it from the government's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it does, in many instances, it's not just represented from government agencies, but sometimes also from the private and civil, um, civil society as well. And with and, um, researchers, the University of the West Indies, so that um, there can be a more, as you say, a holistic approach and as, lot, as, lot, as much information as possible can be put together in driving the decision okay. making process. Uh, thanks, Sean, for um, elaborating a bit more on the makeup of that. I see a question here from Judith says, please discuss what is needed to find green rather than brown solutions. Um, <laughs> well, that was a question that was basically thrown out to the participants here to have a discussion and okay. to bring forth their ideas. Um, we, um, <laughs> for instance, what we've been doing, what, why this came up to be so interesting is because right now we had, we, my agency was spearheading one of the largest um, development projects, um, especially when you think about it, monitoring. And part of that um, that project result um, needed the the rejuvenation of some ground structures that we have. That is uh, protecting one of our biggest um, um, tourist town. So, which you know, um, tourism is one of our greatest contributors to GDP. And so, it was in it. It's important for us to protect both that project as well as the near shore assets that are close by because that project is not just uh, protecting that shoreline but it's also looking at you know preventing storm surges going in and we looked at I've seen um, models which show 
what the sum storage impact and how far inland it would be and how much damage it would cause to infrastructure and so forth. And so it was important for us to, um, to, to, to rejuvenate these things. But these things were built 40 years ago. So we were also looking at solutions that way. And as a result of that, what happened is that we have, it's, it's, it's now supporting a thriving um, reef ecosystem because a lot of corals have established themselves on the borders and so it's, it's, it's acting as a nursery and so forth. And in rejuvenating it result, it would entail us moving the boulders, which would potentially damage um, the ecosystem that is there. And so we were looking for solutions that would help us to have that infrastructural protection, but at the same time, um, preserve the ecology of what is there. And it was, it's a little difficult to find that info. <laughs> Can you imagine it does? I mean, I see J Judith has a video on here. J Judith, do you want to add to that? Um, I just, I think it's a very fascinating question and I don't know how we can um, really move forward on it, but we do need to, obviously we, we all recognize this challenge that, um, you know, um, practitioners sometimes have to take, get a solution, never mind getting the best green solution and so on, so that um, it's not always, nothing is necessarily keeping up with the, even, uh, you know, what's recommended best practice because there isn't that either the funding or whatever is needed to take that really green route forward and I just think if anyone else has any ideas on this as well I think it's it's a fascinating discussion to have and um yeah no I don't have the answers I'm sorry I always say I'm very glad I'm not a coastal engineer we're just oceanographers so we can we can stay in the deep water and just talk about you know what processes are going on rather than trying to intervene and change I mean, I'll throw yeah. a question to you, Sean. Uh, I know if this isn't what you hoped for, but this is what you're going to get. <laughs> um, I mean, your part of development or the planning process, I mean, it's not unusual for big organisations to come in and want to develop a hotel, let's say, on the coastline. They often don't care you know, what the environmental impact is, because as long as they can survive for 10 years, they probably will have found the return on their investment. So where's the, where's, where's the, where's the motivation to encourage them to be more environmentally friendly? Um, right, the, the, the most immediate that I can think of is for in our context, and I think it's the same probably in many jurisdictions, is that in order for you to actually build this hotel, you have to get an environmental permit. So this is an opportunity to um, encourage, um, I mean, you could use stronger words <laughs> um, to get them to be more environmentally compliant. So usually what we have is that you have to get a permit. It has um, regulate, it has stipulations in it and things that you have to adhere to. So one way is to make these a little more stringent. Um, I, can, I think it's an opportunity to enhance data collection because you could then pass, the government is able to pass on that cost to somebody else, but still stipulating how the context in which that data should be collected and how it can contribute to a larger data set. So okay. I think that is one opportunity to kind of, that can be utilized. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Gabby, I see you have a hand up. Uh, hi, Sean. So I immediately have a lot of questions and I already thinking ahead on the science to pull do to address this issue of the reef on the groins. So um, I think there's a lot of things to look at, whether uh, this site is indeed ecologically important. Um, and I will do a bunch of particle tracking experiments to figure that out. Another important point is whether there is similar habitat similar reefs around it. Um, so you can find out uh, whether it's, it's a very important ecological point. And uh, even, even if it is, you may be in need to, to rebuild on this and there's nothing you can do, but you, a, a possible solution uh, to offset that will be um, to build another uh, reef. Um, somewhere to substitute uh, this one and you would like to start on that uh, building a similar artificial reef as soon as possible um, even before starting destroying this one <laughs> and you can even translocate a species to the 
so th there is room for green solutions there and there is science that could aid to inform because um, it's like the forest, you know, there is now uh, green solutions to <clears throat> exploit the forest, but um, it's, you need to figure out whether it's like taking down a tree or if really you are, it's, it's so important um, uh, as of it's connected to many other places that you are really taking down an important patch of the entire forest. Uh, so anyway, I may contact you later, just even for the location of this place, because with the tools we have built uh, during this project, the CME program that is just closing now, uh, even just using that, what's already been done, you may get some insight. Thank, Thank you. you. We, we are on the same page, because those are some of the ideas that we um, have thrown out. Um, not thrown out as in throw away, but have expressed um, to the decision makers about things that are, should be considered in the way forward. So right now what we actually have is that we have to, because we are a government entity, we have to go through a lot of procurement and red tape. So what we try, what we, what the regulators have asked us to do is to do a natural resource valuation on the area to determine its value and then use that to assist in the decision-making um, um, in terms of in, in figuring out a way forward and what is, is best to do. I'm on the same page with you in terms of establishing um, establishing or enhancing other sites using the resources from that, from what's on the ground right now. Um, the, particle, the particle distribution, I caught part of your presentation it, and it took me back to when I was doing my research, so I was very fascinated. Um, I think it would be very helpful because it would it would give us an idea of how the changes or even the construction that is taking place at that at that point how it will affect the rest of the coastline. Okay, thank you. Yes, I always think more on the on the green side, but there is a lot of practicalities also on whether it will achieve your goals as of protection and maybe sediment retention in. Uh -huh. Maybe there are other people in this call that are more suitable to talk about that aspect. Thanks. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, anybody else have anything for Sean? I was just going to ask a bit more about Vision 2030, Sean. Um, I mean, you, you said that there is no real national policy in place but you have this vision statement i take it is, is well, it's not it's a it's a it's, it's a development policy that integrates a lot of um, yeah. the different sectors and so it's it's it has um it's outlined a roadmap or a framework in which to work in order to, to develop to, to achieve this development of yeah. and it's and it has identified where se several different sectors would need strength and okay. support and, and, and can that be enhanced to, to address some of the concerns you have with regards to, you know, providing access for researchers to practitioners and vice versa? Could, could you pull anything out of the Vision 2030 framework to, to enable that? Yes, because, because the, the, the framework is always, it's, it's, it's our national policy that everything needs to be aligned to. Excellent, yeah. Right? And it and it has a strong environmental protection um, component, and and achieving the um, the goals. So I would say yes. And there are researchers um, who are a part of that um, conversation. Okay. And, and this vision, remind me again, this vision twenty thirty. It's a holistic, terrestrial Absolutely. and marine. Everything. Everything. Yeah. So do you social, think financial, environmental, all all ecosystems, everything. Uh, but there's been no further advancement on kind of sectoral policies that have come out of that. So that I would say yes, there has been. Okay. Because it's probably, it's in collaboration with that where the draft um, 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 coastal zone and ocean um, uh, policy has arisen. Okay. And, and has been. That's wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's good to see that there's a, that filtration down, if you know, want a better word, from that overarching Vision 2030 to other areas, and and hopefully, you know, that if if 
that can be developed further, like you say, your initiative can become something a bit more official, you know, for want of a better word, and, and making it more of an official government thing might give it more more strength to, to enable that that interaction between you know the researchers and the practitioners and, and vice versa. So well the, the framework is there and I think that is what they're working with right now. Excellent. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so was there any other questions? Um, I don't see any hands up or any questions. Um, on that, unless anybody else has anything else to say? Was it was there anything more that you'd like people to come back on specifically, Sean? Um, one of your if it, if you were to choose one of your points that you'd like some feedback, which would it be? Um, I think giving some thought to using the data that we have and refining it to make yeah. it more to contribute to the larger puzzle because we do have a wealth of data. And so, so the so is it an absence of marine data policy and a marine data management framework that's that's lacking at the minute? I will. I would want. I'd rather that Marcia answer that question. Okay. <laughs> Did she just pop her line? <laughs> well, the answer to that is yes. There's an absence of a data management okay. policy. They do. The government does have um, a number of. Uh, data policy frameworks in the works, but not specifically for, that's just for accessing data, but to, to sort of pull data together and um, so that it's usable, so that it's accessible for those who need it. There isn't that, and a sort of data sharing policy. Okay. We don't have that yet. Well, um, I mean, not volunteering anything here, but in, in the UK we have a, a, a setup called Medin, and and that that effectively is a, a kind of a centerpiece where different components of marine data uh, can be accessed through the central policy or central central kind of framework. And I know they have you know policy set up to to, to share how the Medin got established and how you deliver best practice. So. I mean, if it's something that we could share with you, if that was of interest to you, I mean, that might be uh, something that we could provide. Uh, I see a man who's just put the website in the in the chat there, um, but, but I know that colleagues, you know, they do have paperwork, you know, that can support you develop, or at least paperwork that can help you better understand how you would then develop a policy for that data management piece. So if that's of interest, we can certainly share share those with you. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of um, Medin. I think for us here, um, <laughs> I don't think we have reached that that um, point with respect to sort of environmental related data. The data policy that we have is a broad spectrum data, like all government generated data and how um, persons would be able to have access to all kind of publicly available data and not specifically scientific or environmental data. So I don't think we have reached that point yet. And I, I am thinking that maybe something where you have an agency that's responsible for environmental data. We have a national environment and planning agency that could be like a focal point for that um, sort of environmental information However, as you can understand, most of these agencies are under-resourced financially and, um, you know, with staff and so on, and each staff has a myriad of responsibilities. But one of the things that I have to say is that the persons in the various agencies do tend to work together, maybe on a more informal basis. Um, we know who the, the professionals and technicians are in the various agencies, and we tend to have a good relationship with each other, and we can call on each other. But for established sort of national database based on scientific uh, environmental data, we're not there yet. Okay. Well, you know, if you, if you would like to continue the discussion uh, to see if we can help in some way, you know, we're here should you need us. Okay, thank you very much for that offer. 
Um, I see there's a question by Gabby in the chat here. Um, for all the participants, what is there in terms of coastal management policy in the other countries present on the call? There's a challenge. I mean, I see Kemron from St. Vincent here. Anybody want to volunteer? No? Um, yeah, we have, we had a, a coast, uh, Marine Spatial Management Planning. Uh, it's been developed. Um, there was a ocean governance policy that was um, actually, well, it was developed by Commander Robin um, being taken over right now. So we have things in development, but at the current stage, they're not, they, they haven't been implemented. Okay. So Thank that's where we are right now. You know, personally, I'm aware that, you know, um, Commander Robin and, and others in St. Vincent's were very proactive, uh, you know, a few years ago, admittedly, in getting things up and running. Um, so I think you're quite right, Cameron, it probably hasn't come to fruition yet, um, but at least the, the, the stepping stones have been laid for St. Vincent to, to eventually get them, and I hope, and I hope that you do soon. That'll be good. Uh, anybody else want to volunteer, whether they have any cost management plans or policies? No? Okay. Okay then. Um, well, thank you, Sean, um, for that, for sharing those um, and, and for Marcia as well. Um, so if there isn't anything else that anybody uh, that's remaining would like to share, um, I would like to wrap up this session and I guess for everybody here wrap up the the, the, the completion of what appears to be a very successful two-week workshop and, and I hope those who are remaining on the call and who have participated in more than this afternoon session that you have benefited from uh, the experiences over the last two weeks and like I said if, if there is an, any follow-on information like that you'd like to to get access or to to discuss with us um, the, all the copies of these um, sessions will be made available and the PowerPoint slides. But of course, so, of course, also we are we are here available to you as well. Um, so, uh, so upon that, unless uh, some of the other organisers, Armani uh, or anybody else, wants to say anything, no. On that then, oh, Armani, there you go. Yeah, just thank you for every, to everyone for attending and making it an interesting couple of weeks. There we go. Thank you very much, Amani, and, and thank you for all your help. And thank you, Sean, I see you, you put a, a link uh, in, the, in the chat there, so we'll have a look at that as well. So without further ado, we've, um, oh, Judith. I know, I just wanted to say thanks to all for attending and for being so um, patient. And, and, you know, a lot of you I've seen on, on many of the sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. So in that case, then, without further ado, you've uh, gained yourself an extra 40 minutes of your afternoon. Um, so with that, I wish you all the very best. Uh, thank you very much. And I bid you farewell.